Hello. All right. Yeah, let's give the Lord a clap on me, right? Amen. Well, hey, you can remain standing. We're going to dive right into the Word of God and just uh, want to take this time to honor your pastors again and love Pastor Randy and Pastor Billy. They're, they're the best. I know you know that already. They're a gift. You know, the Bible says that you ought to receive the gift that God sends. And um, I'll tell you that, you know, I travel, I, I sit there and say, I used to travel a lot. I don't travel as much anymore. And that's by choice. And, um, but, you know, um, you go to certain churches and you just sit there and you go, man, there's something special about this place. Or this is unusual. This doesn't really happen or it's not supposed to happen. And you really realize then and there you're in a miracle. I tell people all the time, you're either attending a church, you're either in a church or you're in a miracle. And you're in a miracle. And this is why you want to guard this place. Guard it with your heart. Guard it with your mouth. Make sure that you honor. Because when you do, listen, God will just continue to bring miracles after miracles after miracles. So open up your Bibles if you can to 1 Samuel chapter 15. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. And the context of this is that Samuel gave a word to the Lord, to Saul. And... Saul, who God had placed a grace on his life, didn't follow through. And he said, Samuel said, has the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and hearken than that of the fat of rams. I want to speak to you today a message I've entitled, The Overflow of Obedience. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same in Jesus name. And all the people that slept in to come to the 11 o'clock service say, amen. Amen. You may be seated today in the presence of the Lord. A few months before 2024, the Lord really spoke to me very clear, and he said that 2024 is going to be the year of more, and yet it's going to be the year in which I'm going to place a grace on this place. And what I did for Saul, I'm going to do it for you. Every year, our church has a theme like yours, and, and I remember... I was running, and the Lord spoke to me what the theme was, and I literally stopped, and he says, I want 2024's theme to be the year of obedience, and I stopped, and I said, Lord, that's not really inspiring. I mean, we need something like, something that's really going to motivate people, and he says, this year is going to be the year of obedience. I remember gathering all of our pastors, including Pastor Billy and began to share my heart and just really felt that this year is going to be a year that's something special. You see, the Bible talks about this story in which Samuel gave a word to Saul. And he says, I want you to gather the children of the people of Israel and go after the Amicalites. The crazy thing about that is that for 400 years, the Amicalites have been torturing the children of Israel. They've been intimidating them, torturing them, and for whatever reason, Israel could never defeat them. But this time, God was going to give a grace upon them, a special anointing that would be placed upon them, that what they couldn't do the, the past 400 years, they will do it this year. And that's what I believe is happening to the church I believe that what we couldn't conquer in 2023, we will conquer in 2024. Because there's this grace that's been placed on our life. Well, Samuel told Saul, as you go, God's going to give you the ability to wipe them all out. And you are to spare nothing and no one. Well, this grace was placed upon them. They land up going out killing all the Amicalites, but Saul did something. He took some of the greatest spoils, the gold and the silver, 
And he kept it. And then when it was time to kill the king, he spared him. He knew that if he would spare the king, the king would raise a statue up about him. And this word got back to the prophet Samuel and God spoke. And God said, I want you to go back to Saul and prophesy this to him. Is sacrifice greater than obedience? You know the story. As it continues, God lifts that grace off of Saul and he places it on a man that was in the back of the field who was completely obedient to him by the name of David. What Saul was supposed to do, that grace that was placed on David is what God began to do. One of the greatest fears I have as a follower of Jesus is that when God puts something on my life, I often think if I mess this up, he's going to put it on someone else's. And so you walk not only in the faith of God, but you also begin to walk in the fear of the Lord. And the thing is, is that what you'll discover is the fact that partial obedience is complete disobedience. In other words, in 2024, you cannot have selective obedience. It's what the church had in 2023. Well, I'll obey God over here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I may not obey him over here. Yeah. The reality is, is that's called selective obedience. Well, you know, God, I can give you my sins, but I can't give you that hurt. That's selective obedience. Well, God, I can give you some of my life, but I can't give you all of my life. That's called selective obedience. And what happened was, was that Saul did what if you're not careful, you will end up doing. And that is when you get everything God has for you and God begins to supernaturally bless your life. Bless your marriage. Bless your family. You will sit there and what started off as obedience will be turned into sacrifice. I've seen this so many times in the 20 plus years I've pastored our church. I've watched people come in broken, lost, confused, addicted. God grab a hold of their life. And he begins to raise them up. He begins to fulfill the dreams that they have in their life. They begin to do things their life has never done before. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them around anymore. They're not coming to church. They're not connected in a small group. They'll say things like, well, Pastor Obed, I just got busy. Well, do you think God's going to bless you with all the blessings just so that you can get busy? Matter of fact, the word busy doesn't even exist in the Bible. It actually means, B-U-S-Y means being under Satan's yoke. See, the goal of the devil is to get you busy. Because if he can get you busy, he gets you tired. If he gets you tired, he strikes you when you're at your weakest. Yep. Yep. The Bible doesn't say that we're to get busy. The Bible says we're ought to get fruitful. How you will know they are of me is by the fruit they bear. And so I've watched people achieve the success that God has for them. I've watched them go from nothing to have everything. And what started off as obedience is now a sacrifice. Oh, well, Pastor Obed, I can't serve every weekend because, man, I got my big boat now. I got to be out on the lake. Well, do you remember when you were broken, you couldn't even pay your rent? And now all of a sudden... When you began to obey God and God began to bless you as obedience will, now that you have everything, why have you allowed that to become a sacrifice? I've watched people do it time after time. I've watched couples come in desperate, hanging on the last thread. And all of a sudden, God steps into their marriage. He begins to restore it. He begins to replenish it. He begins to refresh it. He begins to recharge it. And next thing you know, they're coming in church. They're holding hands. They have their arms wrapped around each other. When the message is being preached, sometimes instead of saying amen, they'll blow each other a kiss. That's a little weird, but they'll blow each other a kiss. 
And the next thing you know, they start serving in the church. Man, they start leading a small group and God begins to flourish their life only to one day just begin to kind of take a step back. Well, we're too involved. We, we were at the church all the time. It's amazing that people would say things like that, but they would never say, well, I was at the club all the time. I was at the bar all the time. Why is it that when it comes to church, we say things like that? Because we've, we've allowed what started off as obedience become a sacrifice. When does church and coming every Sunday become a sacrifice? When does giving of your talent to serve God's people become a sacrifice? When does it come when the opportunity to give God the tithe, when you didn't even have a job and he opened up a miracle for you, that becomes a sacrifice? See, the reality is, is that if you're not careful, the grace that obedience put on you if you don't handle it right, the Lord will take the grace off of you only to get you back in the place of desperation when you need that grace. Come on, somebody, one more time. And I really believe that we got to learn how to steward the blessings when they come upon our life. And the way we steward those is by walking in complete obedience. You see, the Bible talks about it. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Verse one through two, it says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. And then it says this, and all these blessings, not some, come on, say it with me. Come on, say it again. All these blessings shall come upon you and what? Come on, what they shall do, what? Not overwhelm you, but what? Overtake. They overtake you because you what? Obey. Come on, because you what? Obey. Because you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. Why does it not say you obey the actions of God? It says you obey the voice of God. Why? Because Moses is giving a word to the children of Israel and giving them the commanded blessing that is on your life. And how does it happen? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to hear the word of God. The greatest asset on your body is not your heart. It's not even your mind. It's your ears. Because nothing gets to your mind and eventually get to your heart unless it goes through your ears. I was raised in a beautiful home until my father left my mother and being the oldest boy and having two older sisters, you know, when you're Puerto Rican, come on, you got to step up as a man. And I went from playing with G.I. Joes to lawnmower in my grass. I went from drinking Kool-Aid to drinking Old English 800. Come on, somebody, right? I couldn't even afford Budweiser, so I have malt liquor. Come on, am I talking to someone? And so all of a sudden, man, listen, I stopped obeying the voice of God. My life got, got in, in, involved in drugs and alcohol from the time I was 12 to 16, in and out of jail, in and out of prison. And then all of a sudden, I'm 16 years old. My mother's visiting me every Saturday, never drove on an interstate, never drove on a freeway. She'd take a bus to come and see me. And so her and my father picked me up on that Monday and she said, mijo, would you go to church on Wednesday? I said, mama, I'm not going to church. Why would I go to church? And she goes, Mio, you need to go to church. I said, no, nah, I ain't going to church. She, I, she goes, why wouldn't you not go? To, I visited you every Saturday when you was in prison. The last year, I didn't miss a Saturday. Mio, all I want you to do is go to church. I'll make you a panadillas, a reno de papas, all those type of things, right? I need to go to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to church. Why would you not go to church? Because I go, mama, because the church is full of hypocrites. She goes, well, you'll fit in perfectly. I landed up going to church that Wednesday night. That Friday was youth camp. My youth pastor invited me to go. I said, no, 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 it sold out. He says, oh, no, no, there's one more space. I said, there can't be one more space. You said on Wednesday it was sold out. He goes, yeah, yeah, but one spot opened up. I landed up going. I landed up giving my life to Jesus, and my life never looked back. The reality was, was that I had to hear the word of God. You see, every one of you are a byproduct 
of the voices in your life. Nobody is born poor until they're told they're poor. Nobody is told they can't accomplish anything until it's said to them they can't accomplish anything. My mother, every time we would ask her, Mom, we would want that. Never out of her mouth did she say, Mijo, we can't afford that. Because she knew those words would shape our thinking. She would say things like, it's just not the right time. Why? Because at the end of the day, she never wanted her words to place limitations on our thinking. She would always tell us, oh, mijo, the sky is not the ceiling. It's your floor. She would always cause us to raise us up up above the norm. She would never say, mijo, you're going to graduate from high school. She goes, oh, no, you'll graduate with honors in college. You see, the words we hear shape our thinking. Our thinking shapes our life. And then all of a sudden, we're a byproduct of it. So you have to hear the word of God. Then once you hear it, you got to receive it. Most people come to church, they hear the word. Oh, that was a great message, Pastor Billy. But you didn't receive it. You didn't sit there and say, well, that's for me. Oh, well, you can have a changed life. And you're like, well, maybe. No, the, reason, the, re, the reality is you heard it and God gave you the opportunity, but you didn't receive it. You got to receive that word. Man, that's for me. Man, I can have that blessed life. Listen, when you've been broke, busted, and disgusted, when, man, listen, you've messed up all this all your life. And when I was in church and I, I heard the pastor for the first time say, you can live out your dreams. I go, man, I haven't heard that. Man, you could be everything God wants you to be. I'm like, wow, no one's ever told me that. I said, man, if I listen to all the critics, I ought to give this man a chance to speak. And this man began to speak into my life as he spoke into thousands of people's lives. And he showed me how to live a life full of honor, how to live a life full of humility, and how to live a life full of holiness. And I began to live that out since I was 16 years old, kicked out of eight schools, told that I would be a menace to society, in and out of prison to where God has brought me today. Yep. Not because of who I am, but because I heard the word and then I received it. Yeah. And then once you receive it, then you have to believe it. You have to believe that what God says about you is truthful. You believed everybody else. You remember when that cute guy came into your life, said, hey, baby, how you doing? You all that in a bag of chips with a Kit Kat in the bag. And then all of a sudden they start telling you, oh, baby, I'll I'll take care of you. I'll do all these things until you finally realize they overpromise and underdelivered. And then all of a sudden you're living disappointed. You, and then next thing you know, another cute guy comes into your life and you're like, don't even come with me with all that stuff because I heard that before. And all of a sudden, the person that trusted everybody can't trust nobody. What happened? You heard it. You received it. And then you believed it. And it hurts you. You've taken on a mindset of what others have placed on your life. When my wife and I planted Destiny 20 years ago, I went to all my friends. Prior to that, I had a consulting company. I helped all the churches across America. And I remember going to my good friends in Dallas who are the church growth experts. And I said, hey, man, this is the place that we want to plant our church. It's called Indio, California. He looked it up for me. I saw it in his face. And he said, Obed, you're greater than that. I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, no, no, no. You don't want to. You you don't want to plant a church there. That's a graveyard for churches. I said, really? He says, there's 52 nonprofits there. Not one of those churches are over 100 because they don't survive there. He goes, and oh, by the way, the average household income is only 42,000. And the vision that you have, it would never be able to get funded there. I knew once he said that, that was the place I was supposed to go. Yep. And so, man, my wife and I, we packed our U-Haul. 
We headed to the desert. We didn't really know anybody. So, you know, I woke up the next day and it was bright in the desert. And I sat there and looked around, saw all these boxes. And I told myself, what the heck did you do? And all of a sudden, I went from joyful to depressed. And so when I get depressed, I go shopping. Come on, somebody. And so I landed up going to the mall, and I was in the mall shopping, and I'm going up the escalator. And as I'm going up the escalator, Randy's mom comes walk, coming down the escalator. Well, I knew her because I used to preach at her church. And she says, Evangelist Obed? I said, yeah, and we're going like this. She says, wait a minute, I'm going to come up to you. And so she, she, she was coming up to me. I said, no, 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 I'll come down to you. And I came down, and right there was a hallmark. And I said, what are you doing here? She goes, my husband, Randy's father, is in the hospital. He's getting his appendix out. They exploded. And I'm here to buy him a card and some flowers. And you know what he told me this morning? He says, out of the blues, he says, if an evangelist Obed Martinez started a church out here, I'd go. And I said, oh, man. I didn't want to tell anybody because I haven't told some of the pastors here yet. And she goes, well, what are you doing there? Are you preaching? Are you preaching a revival somewhere? I said, no, I'm not preaching a revival. Well, what are you doing there? I'm like, well, I'm here to start a church. Oh, my God. Where? Where are you going to do it? So I just told, I told Mary, I said, Mary, just gather a couple of your friends and come to my mother-in-law's house, and we're going to have a meeting. They were the first seven families. And in that meeting, I had it all printed out. This is what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen. This is where we're going to go. And, the, and, I, and all, I could see it in their eyes. They didn't believe me. So I said, close your eyes. Close your eyes for a moment. Because you can always see further with your eyes closed than your eyes open. And I said, now I want you to feel hundreds of people walking through our doors. Do you feel that? Do you sense it? They began to hear something different they never heard. It's why when your pastors came here and they started speaking things, you were like, come on. You serious? You guys are only a year and a half old. You're going to get a building? Oh, no, we're going to get a building, and we're not going to have no debt to it. Oh, come on. I've heard that before. That's never going to happen. But they were never here to agree with the thinking that was here in the first place. They were here to break that thinking and raise you up to a level of thinking that God has for your life. And so what do you do? You hear it. You receive it, you believe it, and then now all of a sudden, you obey it. The reason why it's hard to obey it is because you don't believe it. And the reason why you don't believe it is because you didn't receive it even though you heard it. There's a lot of people that hear it. God wants you blessed. God wants your marriage to thrive, but you don't receive it. And if you don't receive it, you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, you're surely not going to obey it. So obedience doesn't begin with action. It begins with the word. And the word of God can change your life. It's not me. It's not Pastor Billy. It's not Pastor Randy. It is the word of God. You see, obedience really is obeying God's word. Now, most of you, when you came to, to gospel, you came with a lot of baggage. There was a lot of things in your life, a lot of things that you never thought would come into your life. You were the recipient of other people's dysfunction. You didn't choose to come from a broken family. You didn't choose to get in a relationship and just the outcome end up to be hurtful. No, most of you came here being the recipient of someone else's dysfunction. And so you carried the baggage coming in and you sat there and you saw a young man with some glasses, a little bit of tattoos. I remember when he got them. 
I said, boy, what are you doing? <laughs> and then I started vicariously living through him. I wish I would have those. <laughs> and you see this guy and he's preaching the gospel. And you know what? You came and you looked and the first thing you said, oh, that's just a little young man. What does that little young man have to say? You've allowed your dysfunction to stop you from receiving the word of truth. And so you came and the truth was spoken and it bounced right off of you. And so you left church and you go, yeah, church was good. But you left church still holding on to trash when you had the opportunity to hold on to truth. Trash doesn't set you free. Truth does. Yes, sir. And so what happened was, was that the next time you came, something came you to come back, and you're like, you know, I'm going to try this thing out. I'm going to see if it works. And the next, you know, the word was given, and you caught the truth. When you catch the truth, you'll always let go of the trash. And so what happened was, was that now all of a sudden you're walking with truth? Man, you're sitting there. I'm blessed. God, I'm favored of you. I'm a child of God. I'm loved. Lord, you love me so much. You forgave me. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then all of a sudden you get around some of the old stinking thinking friends. And you know what they come with? Come on. Come up here. Okay? All of a sudden they come holding this. They come holding the trash. And they begin to trash talk. And they begin to talk some trash. And you're sitting there going, oh, man. And if you're not careful, you will land up dropping the truth and taking on their baggage and their trash. Because guess what? You got around it once again. And what you got to realize is that you're no longer called to carry trash. Come on, somebody. You're called to carry the truth of God's word. And so all of a sudden, you come back to gospel, and next thing you know, Pastor Billy's preaching, Pastor Matt, you're going to catch it this time. You catch the truth again, and you're like, man, I got the truth of God. God says, man, I'm blessed. Man, you're going to work saying, man, God, it's going to be a good week. I just thank you for my job. I thank you for all that. You, Lord, I just thank you that you opened up the doors for me to even have an opportunity to work. I can provide for my family. And then you get to, then you get to work, and all of a sudden, a guy that's holding trash is complaining about the job. I can't stand it here. I hate hate this place. Man, I don't even know why I came to work today. And the next thing you know, you start taking on that same attitude and now you're back picking up that trash again. And God's trying to tell you, don't you know I opened up that door to bless you? And don't you know I opened up that door to provide for your family? And now you're talking trash? If you're not careful, what starts off as obedience turns to a sacrifice. When you're called to carry the truth of God's word, everything he says, there's 3,573 promises in this word. 3,573 promises in the word. There's a promise for every problem. What are you going to hold on to? Problems or promises? The promises of God are what? The Bible says they're yes. Come on, somebody. And amen. Well, the Bible says this. Watch this. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, look what it says. 1 John chapter 4 it says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have the boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we. It doesn't say as he was or as he's going to be. It says, as he is, meaning present tense right now, so are we. Wait a minute, Pastor, time out. You mean to tell me that as he is up there, so are we down here? Yes. Read it for yourself. As he is, so are we in what? In this world. So you mean to tell me as he is up there, so are we down here? That's the way we're supposed to be. Well, what does that actually mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means this. It means you have his life. You have his mind. You have his nature. You have his name. You have his ability. You have his power. You have his wisdom. You have his favor. And you have his love. 
as he is, come on somebody, say it with me, so are we. So I have his love, I have his nature, I have his peace, I have his joy, I have his name, I have his ability, I have his power, I have his wisdom, because as he is, come on, so are we. And so at the end of the day, you can't let the devil tell you what you're not. Because guess what? You're no longer holding on to trash anymore. You're holding on to the truth of God's word. And that's what the truth does. It sets you free and it also keeps you free. Well, what else does he say about you? Here's what he says. He says, you're a new creation. What? Yeah, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things have passed away. Behold, all things become brand new. I didn't say that. God said it. He says, you're a new creation. So why do people continue to talk about who you used to be, but they can no longer familiarize them with yourself on who you're becoming to be? Your new creation, you live out of your spirit. Your old creation, you live from your flesh. Your new creation, you walk in faith. Your old life, you walk by feelings. Your new creation... You made decisions, I mean, your old creation, you made decisions based on pressure. Your new creation, you make decisions based on principles. At the end of the day, you're a new creation, which means there shouldn't be no evidence of where you came from. Come on, ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's why when, people, when I tell my story, it's why when you first heard Pastor Billy's story, here's what was going through your mind. No way. You didn't have cancer. No way. You weren't addicted to drugs. Why did you think that? Why was it hard for you to believe it? Because you're seeing his new creation. There's no evidence anymore of where he used to be. At the end of the day, you're living from your new creative, new creative life. And that means I'm living from the truth. And no longer the trash. The Bible also. Here's, here's another thing he says about you. He says watch this. You're an heir to the blessing of Abraham. What? You're an heir to the blessing of Abraham. Here's what he says. Watch this. This is what it says about you. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. That you're an heir. You're the Galatians chapter. You can't punish your future by still blaming your past. When Galatians chapter 3 verse 14 says. He's redeemed you from the curse of the law of sin and death. You're no longer cursed. It's amazing. You get people, well, Pastor Obed, I just don't want what happened to my life happened to my children. What are you saying? That's your old life. That curse was broken. Well, you don't understand, man. I, you know, I, 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 I was raised poor. Well, guess what? You're a part of Abraham's blessing. You got to receive that. Well, God says in your blessing, I'll bless you. In your multiplying, I'll multiply you. Think about that. You know what God told Abraham? He said, look up and count the stars. And as much as those stars are, that is, that is your children. You know how many stars there are? Scholars believe there is one septillion of stars. You don't even know what septillion means. <laughs> It's one comma with 48 zeros behind it. And God says, look up. Do you believe God said, look up and count the stars because he believed that Abraham can count one septillion of stars? Then why did he tell him to look up? Because at the end of the day, if he looked around, if he looked down, if he looked behind, his life would go in the direction his eyes are focused on. People come into your life and tell you what you were only to get your eyes focused on where you came from. And it begins to take you back into that same place. It's why the Bible says, look up for your redeemer draweth nigh. You have the blessing of Abraham on your life. You ought to walk every business person, every, per, every young person that has a dream. You should never allow surroundings to bring limitations to your life. That may happen to somebody else, but it won't happen to us. 
Why? Because I'm walking in the blessing of Abraham. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Watch this. You're more than a conqueror. Romans chapter 8 doesn't say you're conquered. It says you're more than a conqueror. In other words, here's what it says. The only way you can be defeated is if you get distracted. So you shouldn't walk around, oh, man, I'm just going through all kinds of stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. Then the question is, why is the devil even attacking you? He don't attack people on the same side. He only attacks those who are a threat to him. So why does he see you as a threat, but you don't? And you walk around, oh, Pastor Randy, I'm just going through all kinds of stuff. Man, pick yourself back up. You're more than a conqueror. Yeah, yeah. Stop living like as if you were conquered. You're more than a conqueror. No weapon that is formed against me shall yeah, prosper. Yeah, yeah. And the gates of hell shall yeah, not prevail on. against me. If the enemy comes like a flood, the Spirit of God raises a standard up against it. Well, Pastor, everyone's talking about me. Well, let every tongue that rise up against you shall be condemned in seven different directions. I mean, you got to learn to walk in the blessing and the abundance and in the truth that God has for you. Stop believing the lies that are trying to drag you down and live in partial obedience instead of all of obedience. Here's another one. Watch this. You're an imitator of God. What? Yeah, because it gives you no excuse to act like yourself. Ooh. Here's what it says. Watch it. Here's what it means. Come on, put it up. Ephesians chapter 1. If you, look, you model and mirror the majesty of your maker. Well, Pastor Obey, this is the way I am. This is how I am. I'm Puerto Rican and I have an attitude. No, but God doesn't have an attitude. See, when you have an atti attitude, you need to check your altitude. It means you're lowering your standards to the standards that are coming against you. It's why the Bible says, if somebody hits you, you don't hit them back. Why does he say that? Because if someone slapped me, brother, trust me, I slap them back. <laughs> but why does God say that? It has nothing to do with the slap. It has everything to do with standards. If someone's dysfunctional and slaps you, don't get down to the level of their dysfunction. Don't repay evil with evil. Rise above it and repay it with good. So we're imitators of God. When people see us, they should see the love of God in our lives. When people hear us talk, they should hear the love of God in our lives. We're imitating God. I remember, man, when I got jumped into my neighborhood, I didn't talk with slang. I didn't crimp walk like this. Yo, shit. I walked normal. I didn't, I, I didn't wear my pants to my waist. I had them way down here. All because, guess what? You become a result of the surroundings you're with. My mother didn't hold me in a, oh, my baby Obed is going to be a gangster. Oh, he's going to get hooked on drugs. He's going to be an alcoholic. He's going to get kicked out of eight schools, three school districts. Oh, he's going to be a great son. I became an imitator of everybody else. Because I didn't know myself. I was looking to be accepted and approved because my life wasn't affirmed. It's why the first thing God did when Jesus came out from the Jordan, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He didn't anoint him. He affirmed him. Before he did any miracle because he wanted everybody to know don't think I love him for his performance. When you sit there and have a relationship with God, he doesn't care if you raise one from the dead or you raise none. He still loves you because you're his child. And every day when you walk around with affirmation, you're not looking for acceptance and approval because you have affirmation from your father. The next is you're the light of the world. Don't let the cares of life throw shade on your shine. You're justified by faith. I walk by faith and not by sight or feelings. You're highly favored of God. That's from Psalms 512. He surrounds the righteous with favor like a shield. That's not obed. That's the word of God. That's what the word says, right? The Bible says you're a source and symbol of his blessing. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 13. You're blessed. Watch this. Put this up there. You're blessed to be a blessing because when God puts a dream in your heart, 
He starts by putting a seed in your hand. You know, when I got locked up, what blew me away the most was the creativity that was in there. They were creative geniuses. I was like, how did you create that? Oh, I created it for my deodorant. <laughs> and I started to realize it's amazing how the creative genius of heaven, who was Lucifer, would be the one going after the creative geniuses. And his job would do is to take the creativity out of the church. The first attribute God introduced himself as was not the God of love. His first attribute he introduced himself was the God of creation. In Genesis 1, God created. Why? Why did God make it a point that the first introductory that he would introduce himself to the world would not be the God of your salvation, not the God of love, but the God who creates. Because God would sit there and create us in his image and likeness. And so Lucifer knows we are creative beings created by the creator to recreate. You want me to say that one more time? We are creative beings created by the creator to recreate. You want me to go a little deeper? Mm -hmm. God creates the cow. You recreate it into filet mignon. <laughs> God created the pig. You recreated it into bacon. God created the milk. You recreated it and make it into ice cream. God created the silicon. Man recreates it and makes it into a computer. God creates the coal. Man recreates it and makes it into a diamond. We are creative beings created by the creator to recreate. So what's the first thing God attacks? Your creativity. The first thing the devil attacks is your creativity. I'll take it out of you. Because if you don't create, then you're a slave to what creation is. And at the end of the day, you have no limitations on your life. When you're walking in the power and the favor, come on, and the source of the symbol, your life is supposed to be. You're partakers of his divine nature. means everything that belongs to him is given to you. And you can accomplish all things. Not some things. You can accomplish all things. And here's what it says. Watch this. What looked like a giant obstacle last year will become a giant opportunity this year. What you saw scared you last year will be the thing you'll face this year and you'll conquer it. Why? Because you're choosing to walk in the obedience of God. Let me give you this last verse. I'm going to give you four things that I'm going to end. And then I'm going to jump on a plane and go home and see my wife <laughs> and my kids. Psalms 65 says this. You crown the year I added 2024. You crown the year with a fruitful harvest. The paths are worn down by the carts of overflowing with unstoppable growth. How many would love unstoppable growth this year? I said, how many would love unstoppable growth this year? I take this every day. My mother taught me this. Most people would know that if you come to destiny in 20 years, Till this day, I still lead prayer every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I love to pray more than I love to preach. I don't need to preach, but I need to pray. I love prayer. This is why gospel is a house of prayer. It's not a den of thieves. This ain't a miracle because there's favor. The favor's here because they pray. They've been taught to pray. And they know how to pray. And so... Every morning, I get up in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and I get up and just have my devotions, and I pray. But I don't pray prayers. I pray scripture. Yes, sir. God's not obligated to answer your prayers, mm -hmm. but he's obligated to answer his word. And so I teach our church. You, you, you get the problem, and then you Google the scriptures. 
print them out and start declaring the scriptures over your problem. Because Isaiah 55, 11 says, and when the word is sent, not your words, this word, when the word is sent, it would accomplish what it's been sent out to do. You want your prayers answered? Stop praying your feelings and start praying his word. Ooh. Well, Pastor Obed, I can't pay my bills. Well, Lord, I just ask you that you pay my bills. No, that's not faith. That's begging. You're a covenant child. You get his word and you say, Lord, your word says in Philippians chapter 4, 19, that you're the God that supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, I'm just asking you to abide by your word. You said heaven and earth will pass away before your word does. God, you're going to make it happen. Yes. How many know that's not begging? Come on, that's yeah, faith. Yeah, yeah. And you want to know what pleases God is not begging. What pleases God? Faith, faith pleases God. We sit there, oh, God, you know, would you heal my marriage? And you still want that cycle. No, no, no. You get out the word. And every day you sit there, what God you put together, let no man separate. Father, I thank you that marriage is a covenant. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that my marriage is going to thrive. My marriage is going to grow. My marriage is going to increase. We're going to have a love for each other like we never had before. And when you're done, you sit there, put your Bible on the ground, and you say, Lord, I've done it. Now I'm going to stand on the word of God. Because when you've done all, just stand on the scriptures and so you're not we're not talking about blessings but without talking about scripture we're not talking about prosperity unless we're talking about scripture we're not talking about that God wants this abundant life for you no it's what he says he wants for your life all we're doing is repeating what the word says and we're just crazy enough to believe it. You want to know why? Because I was crazy enough to believe when my first, when my friends brought me some weed and said, why don't you smoke this? I was crazy enough to believe it when they brought me an old English 800 and I took my first drink. I was crazy enough to believe when they brought heroin in speed and I began to take it. Well, if I'm crazy enough to believe that, how many know I should be crazy enough to believe the word of God? And so you can't tell me anything. You can't convince me that God wants to keep you the way you are. Yes, and that's why when we went to that city, we planted that church there. People started coming from everywhere. Other pastors were scratching their heads. Then they started hating. It's crazy. Sipping on haterade. <laughs> and so you know what I decided? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to invite all the pastors in the community, and we're going to bless them. And then we sent out. None of them responded. I said, man, I thought we're supposed to be unified. Mm -hmm. So I got together with pa our pastors. I said, I know what we're going to do. We just, you can, I'm going to close. It's Christmas time. I said, we're going to drop off a check for their church, and we're going to drop off a check for themselves. And I'm going to see who's going to return the checks. Because we don't respond the way they do. We respond according to the word. The Bible says, love your shepherds. Take care of them. So we wrote, you've been giving your life to your church. Man, you've been blessing. And so Billy and I and all of us, we went to churches. We told the pastors we're coming by. And we dropped off these envelopes. You should have saw their faces. They couldn't believe it. What? Well, bless us. I had one pastor look at me and say, I talk about you. I said, praise the Lord. I didn't realize. Now I know why your church is blessed. We just believe the word. We told our church, if you give to a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you offer a cup to a prophet, the blessing of the Lord would be upon it. So we decided. We love to give to missions, but our missions will be pastors. For 17 years and counting, thousands, tens of thousands of pastors have walked through our doors of our church. Everything we have, we give it to them. Matter of fact, we write our own curriculums and then we tell them, hey, we'll change the cover and put your name on it like you wrote it. We don't need it for ourselves. Let your church celebrate you. It blows their mind. 
Well, pastor, we got to do something. No, it's the word. Let the word do it for you. At the end of the day, you're not part of a church that just wants you blessed. You're part of a church that just believes what God says about this. And it tells you that you got a better life than what you're experiencing right now. I'm experiencing a great life. You can have a greater life. That's what God wants. Here's what he's going to do. Four things really quick. Number one, four promises. Number one is unstoppable growth. He wants to give you unstoppable growth this year. You ought to believe that. Lord, I know you're going to. Here's what the word says. Not this is what Pastor Obed, Deuteronomy 28 says this. Here's what it says. Verse one. Watch it. Put it up. Verse one. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Boy, I was sitting there going, doesn't this fit gospel? I ate last night in the town, and then I had to drive through the fields in order to get to the hotel. You ought to be quoting that scripture every day over your life. Lord, thank you that the towns and the fields will be blessed. The second is a unified family. How, would, how many of you would love a unified family? My family to be unified. Well, that's a promise of God. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says this. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and your flocks will be blessed. That's not Obed. That's the word. The word says your family can be unified. So when you have that temptation to pick up the trash and say, well, my children are disobedient. Don't say that. You say, my children are going to come into obedience. When I would come home high. Four o'clock in the morning, hooked on drugs. My mother would open up the door. She says, how's my preacher doing? I said, mom, I'm no preacher. I'm a gangster. How's my preacher doing? I remember one morning, I wake up, and I threw off the sheets, and I look back, and I saw a stained cross on my sheets. I ran into my mother's room. I said, what did you do? What did you do? She goes, I prayed in your room. I said, no, you have your own room to pray for. She goes, no, my room's already holy and sanctified. Your room is my prayer closet. And I've laid on your bed to raise you up from the dead. I'm not where I'm at today because somebody was speaking trash to me. I'm here today because I held on to some truth. The, watch this. The next is this, man, is unlimited blessings. God has unlimited blessings for your life. What does the word say, Pastor Obed? Your fruit baskets and your breadboards will be blessed. What? They'll be blessed. Are you kidding me? Yes. Do you believe it? Or do you hear it through the filter of trash? And then the fourth is unmerited favor. God wants to give you favor. Let me share this, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Randy to come up. You say, how can this happen to me? I'm in Fredonia. I live in a place where, you know, people are just happy just living. No, but you have dreams in your heart. There was a man who was raised in a family of six. Every one of his siblings were called to ministry accept him he never heard the voice of God say you're going to be a preacher like his brothers and sisters they'd come home from camp mom dad I've been called to ministry he'd always say Lord you're passing me by well this man one day got a job at a store he'd walk into the store declaring the favor of God I thank you Lord for your favor thank you God that you're going to bring an increase. Thank you, Lord, that I'm going to be a manager of this store. A year later, he becomes the manager. He comes running home. Mom, 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 mom. You're not going to believe it. I'm the manager of the store now. His mom, who was a pastor, so proud of him. One day in a revival, the Lord speaks to him. He says, I didn't call you to the pulpit, but I called you to build sanctuaries all around the country. He didn't understand that. What do you mean, Lord? I'm going to call, I'm called to build sanctuaries around the country, but not called to the pulpit? What am I supposed to do? He says, you're just supposed to be who you are and I'll bless you. Well, he decided, well, guess what? 
I'm going to open up my own store. He started with nine picture frames. That's it. You have the pictures? He would go, he would go into the neighborhood like this, post them on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the trees. And he would tell people, hey, come to my store. And God told him, listen, I want you to put a Bible in every person's hand. He said, Lord, I don't have anything. He says, yes, you do. So he went home. He found three extra Bibles. First three customers came to his store looking for a picture frame. He didn't sell any. But each one of them, God told him, give him a Bible. The next Sunday, he goes to church, and he goes up there and he says, anybody have any extra Bibles sitting around? I'll take them. Lands up taking them. Gets 100 Bibles. Every customer that came in didn't buy nothing. But he gave them a Bible because it was in his heart. Lord, if you build my business, I'll give everyone a Bible. I'm going to stay obedient to that. Well, next thing you know, he was able to buy a machine that that machine could eventually start to build out those picture frames. And he, the next year, he gave a thousand Bibles away. The year later, he gave 5,000 Bibles away. And every year it began to grow and his stores did too. It wasn't until one day, these two young kids walk into his office and say, sir, we have this, this app. It's a Bible that people could put on their phone, but we can't afford it. Do you think you can pay for it? And he remembered, I'm to put the Bible in every person's hand. And so the first Bible app that was ever placed in the first iPhone is right there in their store, in their headquarters. Today, over 750 million downloads read that Bible from the Bible app every single day because one man was obedient to God and never allowed what started off as obedient become a sacrifice. Well, one day, he's facing the greatest trial of his life. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. He never wanted to give abortion pills as part of their insurance. And at that time, it was the law of the land. But he was standing on God's word. And he says, if I have to lose it all, I won't lose anything because I'm standing on the truth. He went to the Supreme Court. One day during the trial, he tells his attorneys on a break, I just need to go for a walk. He goes for a walk. He's walking around D.C. and he sees this building and God speaks to him and says, buy that building. He says, Lord, I'm in the middle of a trial. I'm in the middle of a Supreme Court. Buy that building. Obey me. He could have easily retreated to just a sacrifice. But he knew obedience is better than sacrifice. So he calls his real estate agent, tells him the address, and he buys it. Today in Washington, D.C., that's the Bible Museum. $700 million and paid it cash. The guy I'm talking about is a man named David Green, who's a mentor of mine. He's the owner of Hobby Lobby. Every time you go into a Hobby Lobby store, it has worship music on. The reason why is because God told him, if you'll build my stores, make them sanctuaries. And people don't realize they go into a Hobby Lobby store and they're actually walking into a sanctuary. Come on, somebody, right? Why? Because it all, go back to the first picture, it all started with that. If you'll trust God with the little, come on, he'll give you every dream that you have if you'll just remain obedient. And friends, the challenges are going to come, the time's going to come when God's going to say, give me a little bit more obedience. You remember, don't ever allow what started off as obedience turn into a sacrifice. Lord, I want to give it to you in Jesus' name.